Okay, uh, good evening and welcome to the Eden Monero Federal Election Candidate Forum with a focus on climate and environment. We're still all pouring into the room, I can see. We've got 34 people in the room and uh, a big list of people who have responded. So, but we will start this, the proceedings now. I am Jo Oddy, I'm president of Climate Action Monero. I, this evening, we acknowledge that the Ngambri, Ngunnawal, Wiradjuri, Narigo, and Yuan people as traditional owners of country in the Eden Monero electorate. We recognize their continuing connection to land, water, and communities, and pay our respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to elders past, present, and emergency and emerging. Apologies for that. Now some Zoom protocols. I ask everyone to stay on mute throughout this forum. Um, please make sure your proper name shows in your Zoom screen and you can do that by hovering your mouse over the three little dots in the top right hand corner of your video image and you can find the rename option there. And we certainly welcome our candidates to rename with your party name. You will be able to post questions to candidates um, in the chat, and you can, you're welcome to do that throughout the forum. Um, please identify to whom you are directing your questions, and these questions are being collated and will be put to candidates later in the meeting. So who are we? Climate Action Monero covers the Snowy Monero Regional Council area. We work with other climate groups across Southeast New South Wales and also, of course, in Eden Monero. And we are members of the Climate Action Networks of Australia and the Nature Conservation Council of New South Wales. We are 60 members strong and have been in action for 11 years and with so much work still to do. Yes, this meeting is being recorded and the recording is in progress. We do political advocacy, community education, and we provide opportunities for our community to learn about climate science and technical solutions for reducing carbon. Tonight, we're proud to be working with the New South Wales Nature Conservation Council. And I'll now hand to Dee Newton to welcome on behalf of the Nature Conservation Council. Over to you, Dee. Thank you. I just had to spotlight myself. <laughs> Um, I'd just like to say thank you for everyone for, for coming today and just a little bit about Nature Conservation Council. Um, Nature Conservation Council of New South Wales was formed more than 65 years ago and prior to that nature was absolutely pillaged on an industrial scale in the state. Today NCC has over 200 member groups. They form an environmental movement of thousands of people who've been working to protect nature for over six decades. We work with these groups spread across New South Wales to save koalas and their habitat, stop logging in our native forests, replace coal-fired power stations with renewable energy, as well as protecting our precious rivers and waterways. We lobby politicians, organize submissions and provide research as well as supporting our groups during election campaigns. It is through our member groups hard work, vision, tenacity and courage that they, are, they have become a voice for nature. And it's through their work that we have been able to achieve some extraordinary results. Tonight, NCC is delighted to partner Climate Action Monero in hosting this candidates forum where candidates can state their position on taking urgent action on climate and outline their plans and policies on how they will protect our nature, our natural and human environments. Thank you so much. Great, thanks, Steve. And at this point, I'd also like to thank Farmers for Climate Action for their support in distributing this forum information to everybody, so to, the, to their supporters. So I think I've seen Pete holding in the room. So thanks, Pete, for your support from Farmers for Climate Action. It's so exciting to see so many passionate environment and climate people around the room. Um, I know we've had an RSVP from Joe Dodds, President of Bushfire Survivors for Climate Action, and we've also had an RSVP from 
the member for Bega, the state seat of Bega, Dr. Mike Holland. So um, Dr. Holland, if you're out there, you are most welcome. So now over to our candidates. The candidates who are joining us this evening, we warmly welcome the seven of you. Tonight, we will be joined by Greg Butler for the Democrats, also Darren Garnon for the United Australia Party, James Holgate, Sustainable Australia Party, Vivian Harris for the Greens, Christy McBain, our current Labor MP, Tony McLennan for the IMO, and Andrew Tyler, Independent. We've had an apology from Max Holmes, the Liberal Democratic Party member or candidate who had intended to join, but he had to work. Um, and, and we've had no response from Dr. Jerry Knuckles of the Liberal Party or from Shannon Boyd from One Nation. We ask for respectful behaviour from all attendees. We're aware that at many online candidate forums that have been held so far, that there've been people trolling and anyone disrupting a respectful forum will be removed this evening. So thank you for your, for your um, great behaviour. Um, we will be recording this session and I think we're well of that by now. So as far as an order of events goes, candidates will have two minutes each to present their pitch and the candidates have all been provided with three questions and will each have one and a half minutes to respond to these set questions and we'll work through those question by question. We ask you as attendees to submit your questions in the chat along the way. Remember to identify to whom you're directing the question. And our team will be collating these, these questions and I will direct them to the candidates later on in the forum. And there'll be about 10 minutes available for, to address these open questions. Now, before we head off to the candidate pitch, I just wanted to remind everybody that the economy and our wonderful livelihoods in Eden Monero are largely dependent on the quality of our environment and a stable climate that we really hope will stay under one and a half degrees of warming. Our wonderful economy is based on tourism in winter, tourism in summer, agriculture, renewable energy, plantation forestry, and many other things. And these are all dependent on a great environment and a stable climate. So let's cross now to our candidates to have their say and find out what they have to say about these issues that are important in our electorate. Now, candidates, I'll be keeping time and I'll be um, looking to stop you by two minutes. So let's go over the first candidate for a two minute pitch. Um, I invite Greg Butler of the Democrats for your two minute pitch. Thanks, Greg. Good evening. Thank you all for attending. And thank you to the Nature Conservation Council of New South Wales and Climate Action Monero Incorporated for providing this opportunity to speak to you all. I would also like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of this land. I'm Greg Butler. I live in Murrum Bateman on 40 acres and I planted 150 trees during the COVID lockdowns. I'm a foundation member of the Australian Democrats. I'm a professional engineer and I have a career constructing and maintaining railway lines and infrastructure. I'm a foundation fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and a former Union Federal Divisional President. I'm a volunteer motorsport official and I restore classic cars. I'm running in this election because I'm disgusted by the fact that despite Australia being an affluent nation, we still have 3 million Australians living in poverty. It is hard for people who worry about where their next meal is coming from or if they will have a roof over their heads night to contribute to reducing climate change. All Australians deserve access to nutritious food, good clothing, long-term accommodation, appropriate healthcare and quality education. I will work to reduce the inequity in our society so that we all share in our national prosperity. I can understand why people complain about the loss of freedom. We give up some personal freedoms to work as a community for the greater good, but the greater good should include us all. Those who have lost some freedom for inadequate return and no safety nets are understandably angry about decades of inaction by the major parties. I will work to restore people's trust in the government to provide adequate safety nets to make sure we leave no one behind and to remove corruption from our democracy. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. 
And you are excellent, just coming under two minutes. We'll now go to Darren Garnon, United Australia Party. Can you hear me? Yep, okay. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for attending. This is uh, my first uh, Zoom meeting as such, so it's a new experience, another one along the way. Um, look, I run my own business in, in Queanbeyan. I joined the United Australia Party, not because I'm a career politician. I saw what was happening in our society, the loss of freedoms, uh, the mandates, the lockdowns, and I thought the UAP represented a party that would restore our democracy and our freedoms back to this country. Myself, um, I'd like to see this country come back to where we're a bit more polite with each other, where we respect each other more, where we can have freedom of speech and respect each other's opinion on what they want to say to us. For myself, I've always found the best way to learn is to listen. So I'd like to say to everyone out there that if you're looking for a candidate who will listen to what you have to say and take that into the, into the house, well, I would be that person. I think we all ex expressed uh, what Greg had to say, because that is, I've sat down with these men and I've actually enjoyed their company and I find that we are all pretty much philosophically the same. So on that point of saving the environment, I'm more than willing to do that. I live my life that way, I have always. I've been a vegetarian for 30 years. I have these same philosophical beliefs as a lot of people here tonight and I want a better community for my grandsons. That's it. Great, thank you, Darren. Um, and now to James Holgate, Sustainable Australia Party. Over to you, James. Sorry, I just needed to unmute. Thank you very much. Uh, look, thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, Christy had a great idea last night, which was for we candidates to swap, uh, swap do each other's pitches. Uh, uh, pro, I, I thought we might throw our hat, hat into a, 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 a names into a hat and do that, which uh, is not as silly as it sounds because we could then demonstrate that we understand what each other, where each other are coming from, and there is a lot of common ground here. I represent the Sustainable Australia Party. I ran as an independent in 2019 and then in the by-election in 2020 when I was approached by the Sustainable Australia. Well, in fact, I rang around to see where to direct my preferences. And as it turns out, my personal philosophy um, and values very much align with the Sustainable Australia Party, which is an independent movement, very important to me, um, with a science and evidence-based approach to policy. Um, and the, the three main tenets for us are obviously to protect the environment, to um, stop overdevelopment and to stop corruption. And I think, um, Certainly, uh, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the Australian continent. I mean, uh, First Nations peoples are probably great exemplars of sustainable living. They lived here for 60,000 years and know how to look after the place. And I think that's something that really we should value and learn from. There's much, much to be learned. Um, as I said, I think we can sit down and understand and respectfully debate. We, there's a lot of common ground that we can go through, but at the end of the day, my feeling is that um, corruption, and that comes down to party donations, major party donations, get to dictate policy, uh, which is more in the interests of vested interests, that the net result of, of a concept of... Time's of, up, James. Okay, well, we want, we want to redefine growth. More is not better. Thanks, James. Um, that's great. Over now to Vivian Harris of the Greens. You right to go? Yes, Vivian? I'm good. Thank you. I'm here tonight because it's a climate emergency and I am speaking from Dhirangarn country on land that was never ceded and I thank the elders past, present and emerging for their continuing care of this land. I am a mother and a grandmother and a climate activist, and I became a climate activist after reading the 2018 IPCC report. And on reading the latest IPCC report, um, it is full of, yeah, the, it is really stark with how little time we have and the uh, degree of um, an urgency of the change that we need to make. But it is actually also full of solutions. 
And the solutions are to stop opening any new coal and gas and, and oil fields, to switch to renewables, which are now cheaper as fast as possible, to negotiate and to consult with First Nations people and marginalised people and vulnerable people when we do climate solutions and, mitig and mitigation. To, and this is interesting, but in, in the IPCC report, it also says that we need to increase our social housing. We need to decrease inequality. We need to increase transparency of government. We need to increase our and improve our education and our healthcare. And we need to give equality to women. Now, if this sounds like Greens policies, that's no, that's no coincidence. It's because Greens actually follow science when developing their policies. And that is why I am, I am a Green. The, the main reason you should vote for the Greens is because we don't take corporate donations. And we... And so consequently, we are only beholden to the Australian people. And we're, so, hey, Joe, we'll get to our mission targets when we do the question. So our policy is based on science and it doesn't, we don't actually take any donations from fossil fuel companies and we have a real chance of holding the balance of power. Thanks, Vivian. Yeah. Time's up. Thank you, Vivian. Great. Over now to Christy McBain from Labor. Over to you, Christy. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, I am the current member for Eden Monero and uh, was elected in a by-election in July 2020. Um, since that time, I've um, travelled over 90,000 k's across the electorate uh, talking to individuals, to businesses, to community groups, to industry about a whole range of issues affecting uh, them at this point in time. We know we've been through a pretty tough um, few years on the back of multiple natural disasters, a prolonged drought and COVID. Um, a lot of the Labor Party's policies that have been uh, developed for this election are after listening uh, very much to what people are saying on the ground. Um, we have a Powering Australia policy, which looks at um, a 43% reduction of carbon emissions by 2030, um, investing in renewable energy technology, uh, making sure that we can make more things here in Australia by bringing manufacturing back to this country uh, with the help of renewable energy, because uh, we need to bring down the cost of electricity so we can actually start to manufacture more things back in this country. Uh, we want to see more Indigenous ranges placed in our national parks. Um, right across this electorate, we've got multiple national parks, uh, and it would be fantastic to make sure that we are learning from our First Nations people. Um, we have a, a plan for community batteries across uh, the, uh, the electorate and the country. We want to see more um, electric uh, charging stations placed across the country. Uh, we have a number of uh, policies, as I said, uh, which are all aimed at uh, bringing down the cost of electricity. Uh, because we know that the cost of living is really uh, increasing and hurting people at this point in time. Uh, we need to make childcare cheaper. Not only is it great for uh, kids, uh, for their educational development, um, but it's fantastic for families who um, will obviously uh, be able to get back into the workforce if that is their choice. Um, there are a whole range of policies um, that we have um, I think the biggest thing, though, that people talk to me about is um, one of the biggest things is Thanks, integrity Christy. in politics, and yeah. I'll leave it there. Great. Thanks, Christy. Let's go now to Tony McLennan from IMO. Hello, everyone. I'm Tony McLennan, and I'm from the Informed Medical Options Party. And uh, the party was created in 2016 uh, by a fellow up in uh, northern New South Wales who owns a health retreat and uh, his priority in life is to get Australians healthy and active. And, um, and during the COVID um, crisis, I, my business has suffered greatly uh, as a result of the measures and the, um, uh, and, and the mandates and the lockdowns. And I also received, uh, got a vaccine injury, which uh, was very concerning for me. And I, um, I decided to look into, you know, the responses that the government uh, put in place 
and I believe there was a better way. And this is what's driven me into politics because I feel like so many businesses have gone under in this country. So many people lost their jobs and lost their freedoms and it's um, it, it doesn't sit well with me. Uh, I've actually ran, I created my own national political party in 2007 and I ran for the federal, uh, for the federal uh, Senate. I was unsuccessful, but it certainly gave me an understanding of how politics works in this country. Um, uh, since then, I was elected in 2012 to the Queen Beanne Council and I served one term. I decided not to run again because I wanted to concentrate on my small business, which is in Canberra. And, uh, and a few years ago, I created a not-for-profit called Hear Our Voice and it advocates for equality for women in our parliaments. And that is uh, something that's very near and dear to me. Um, I think groups like yours, and I want to, sorry, I should have said right from the start, I want to thank the Nature Conservation Council and the Climate Action Monero. Uh, this is the kind of thing that um, we need. We need people to be active like you. Uh, we need community groups that are passionate about this, these things that are of concern uh, to, to the planet. And, um, you know, my hat's off to you, and I, I think it's wonderful. Have I got yeah. one minute left? No, no. Thanks, Tony. Oh, Time's that's it. Up. Sorry. Thank you. Yep. Time's up. Thanks, Tony. Um, now over to Andrew Taylor, Independent. Good evening. Um, you all know him. We're still not friends, uh, which is a shame. Climate Action Monero, you're actually quite nasty to me and you don't seek to include me more generally in your wider conversations. Now, if you want to know about, sorry about the light, if you want to know about technology change and reducing emissions and what have you, you want to have solar farms in the Monero, well, you don't even talk to the bloke that owns solar farms. I've just started a new business that's going to actually allow our grid to have more renewable energy. You don't know about it. It's quite pathetic, to be honest. Now, I'm not going to be polite. I'm not going to sop up to you. You aren't going to vote for me. You're not interested in a lot of what I say more generally, more broadly. You don't care that I try to encourage our council to adopt solar panels during the 60 cent and 20 cent rebate schemes. You're actually a joke, to be brutally honest. You claim you want to get to net zero by 2030. Labor wants it by 43%. Um, no one ever talks about the how. We still need concrete, we still need bitumen, we still drive cars, we still drive trucks, you still buy stuff. All of that needs diesel. Yes, there are alternatives, but it costs more. Everything will cost more. Now the Greens want to always spend more public money. The only way we're going to get to net zero is to pay more tax to buy less things. So that means if you pay more tax whilst buying less things, everything gets more expensive, which is an inflationary environment, which we've just entered with a quarter percent rate rise for interest rates yesterday. You don't understand the fundamentals and you rely on platitudes. I'm the kind of bloke that says, no more platitudes. You want to talk about real action? Now, Jenny, you've been quite nasty to me and horrible over the years. So don't try and tell me to stop it. This is my chance to tell you to stop it. Why don't you work with me? Why don't you talk with me? Why don't you sit down with me? I know. Okay, way thanks, more about Andrew. This. Your two minutes is up. Thank you. Yeah, and two okay. minutes is ridiculous. Okay, fine. Yep. Let's go. Thank you, candidates, um, for your pictures. And um, that was super interesting. We'll go now to questions. So I'm just going to share screen on the first question. And let's go to that, it's just so everyone in the room can see the question that you've been asked. The first question is about clean energy. With Australia already experiencing 1.4 degrees of warming, climate change is the key issue for the nation. Whoops. And this electorate. Our unique environment, our industries and our communities are at risk from extreme climate events already with the risk increasing every day. If elected, what will you do to transition our electorate and nation to a clean energy future and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 50% across all sectors by 2030? That is the question that has been sent to all candidates. We will start this session with Tony McLennan from IMO. Over to you, Tony. Yes, look, thank you for, for asking that important question. I mean, my view is- One minute 30, sorry. Oh, okay. 
Sorry, yes. 130. Uh, my view is that we should try and aim for uh, zero emission by 2035. I think I, I want to say this uh, up front. I think the problem we're having is that we keep doing the same thing. So at each election, we vote. Uh, we vote either the Liberals in or the Labor Party in. And what we have is an, a monopoly. And what we need are more diverse voices in Parliament. I mean, Joe, you might make a, a fabulous politician. I mean, you've got the heart and the soul and the, and the environment. And if you don't belong to Labor or Liberal, the chances of you getting elected are Buckley's and none. And we have to change that. In this country, we have got a monopoly on our political arena. And I know, look, I, we go over and over these things. I've been to so many over the years of people concerned about what's happening in the world and nothing ever changes. It, we, just, we just get more of the same. And we need to have different voices in Parliament. And my, you know, I, I'd really like people to consider, I mean, who says we have to vote Labor and Liberal? Who says that independence and micro parties, representative from micro parties, can't end up and do a great job in, in Parliament. Um, and I believe if we want a change in our political landscape, you have to put the major parties last so that we change who is in our parliaments. And we need different voices, we need new blood, and we need people who are going to actually act upon the things that the people are Thanks, concerned Tony. about. Thank Thanks, you. Tony. Thanks, Tony. Yep. Okay, next, Christy. Thanks for your answer to this clean energy question. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, Joe. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Labor has a Powering Australia plan which aims to reduce emissions by um, a minimum of 43% by 2030. Um, it will become Australia's target under the Paris Agreement, which will keep us on track for net zero by 2050. Uh, as I said, we see this as the bare minimum, um, and if we can get over that, that would be fantastic. Uh, our plan would create an additional 600,000 jobs, with five out of every six jobs um, being in the regions. Um, we have had this modelled, which would spur an uh, additional investment of $76 billion. Um, our plan looks at cutting uh, power prices by a minimum of $275 a year compared with today by 2025. Um, and we'll also see us uh, equal our trading partners in their ambition, uh, partners like Canada, South Korea and Japan. Um, it's achievable. Um, it's uh, detailed and outlined. Uh, it has the backing of the industry group, the Chamber of Commerce, the National Farmers Federation, ACTU and um, Meat and, uh, sorry, Red Meat and Livestock Association as well. So we've spent considerable time consulting and making sure that uh, this plan is achievable with industry as well as businesses. Great, thank you. Thank you, Christy. Now over to Vivian Harris of the Greens. One minute 30, Vivian. Okay, I'm just... Okay, um, the Greens um, have actually got all their policies on climate change po uh, costed by the Parliamentary Budget Office. So we're planning to tax billionaires and stop the tax cuts and, and stop fossil fuel companies, okay, make companies pay tax. So we are aiming for 75% uh, by 2030 and net zero by, 20, by 2035. We are also going to stop um, we're not going to open any more coal mines or, or gas fields. We are going to close all the coal power stations and thermal coal mines by 2030. And we are going want, we plan to become a renewable superpower and have green manufacturing in Australia. Um, uh, household wise, um, we're going to have re big quite big grants for home batteries and for renewable cars and put in an EV um, infrastructure. And I think that's the time up. Great, Thank, thanks Vivian. And you're well ahead of time. Let's go now to James Holgate, Sustainable Australia Party for your answer. Uh, many thanks. Uh, look, we are here and you will have seen in the chat there, you know, the, the targets that have been quite well rehearsed. I, I am, uh, I appreciate that uh, some of my, uh, the other candidates are actually asking the hard questions about how we're going to do this and, uh, um, you know, it, it's certainly an international problem, uh, but the Sustainable Australia Party certainly wants to fund and subsidise research and development into renewable energy technologies and energy efficient initiatives. 
uh, we want to adopt a renewable energy target in line with our commitment to, on zero net emissions, impose a moratorium on all new coal mines in Australia, impose a moratorium on all new fracking, including for coal seam gas, uh, phase out fossil fuel subsidies, and adopt a globally consistent carbon pricing mechanism that does not unfairly penalise Australian initiative, uh, industries. Now, um, I know that the government's been talking a lot about reliance on, on technology. We really do need to, to make a difference internationally uh, to transition, um, make fossil fuels redundant, basically. And, uh, you know, those people who are using solar power and so on, that's, that's great. You could look at your own personal behaviour, whether it be eat less meat, uh, choose to holiday close, more closely, um, uh, work from home more where you can, but it's certainly something that's going to require concerted action very urgently. Great. Thank you, James. Whoops. Whoops. Okay. okay. Now we're going to Andrew Tuller. Your minute 30. Andrew, off to you. Yep. Uh, if we let the Greens uh, do any of their policies, they would bank out, bankrupt our country many times over. It's insane. Now, Labor says that they're going to reduce power prices. What a load of crap. 43% or more of every power bill is network, car, network charges. Most of the network's been privatised. The retail component of the actual electricity is quite small. We've seen the spot price of coal. Newcastle Port jumped to 450 a tonne on the back of the Ukraine war, or the Russia-Ukraine war. Unless you look at the broader circumstance about what's going on, you're kidding yourselves. Now, I'm not saying we can't do it. I'm just saying, do you know how to make concrete or cement without coal? No one's yet made cement strictly from electricity. We can build wind farms from electricity. We can make wind farms and solar, panel, solar panels from electricity, but we can't make bitumen from electricity, which we need to drive on. I said the other day at Bermagui, 21 million cars in this country, 0.3% are electric. There's a long way to go. Now, if we electrified all our cars, we would need four or five more power grids as in size than we currently have. So don't listen to Labor or Greens. It's just platitudes. It's just throwaway lines. Nothing will happen. If you want change, you need to engage with people who actually get out there and invent stuff, make stuff and make the change. Look at my record. Look at the stuff Great. that we Thanks, did Thanks, Andrew. Your minute 30 is up. Let's go now to Darren Garnon. Over to you, Darren if you'd like to switch on your mic. Well, like the other candidates, I mean, I support all forms of energy uh, maintain our current standard of living. Um, I'd like to see a reduction in consumerism. I think that's what, on a clean earth, I think that's one of the key things I've been looking at from that point of view. Consumerism, just you only have to drive around and I spend a bit, bit of time on the road, as Christy does, and I, I appreciate the work she does for that. But, we really need to look at how much simple things, throwing rubbish out the car as you're driving the road. Pull out the side of the road, anyone in the Monaro there, and go and have a look. I mean, the amount of plastic is laying on the side, I can't believe it. Now, I advocate we speak up and we start to educate each other on this topic. I'm a bit confused and lost because, like everyone else that's sitting around here, I want a cleaner world, I want a much better world. So I would advocate that we need to look at what that energy future looks like. Being, coming from a business background, I want to know what the correct balance is of how much energy do, do we need. And I've done some numbers here, uh, just on a quick look. But in Australia, we produce 243 billion kilowatts and we consume 229.4 billion kilowatts. So there's not much left in the system there. So if we can look to, to understand that we can use our coal and we can transition across together, like we might have to sacrifice to get to that end result we want. But I think it's a realistic conversation for us to have. Sit down and look at it from a business model because that's what we're doing. We're spending money. Money is business. It's as simple as that. Um, now, what is that total cost? We can work out actually how many you know, wind turbines we need by the size they are and how much energy they'll put out. Thanks, Darren. Yep, time's up on that one. Oh, yep. Over now to Greg. Greg Butler, Democrats. Are you there, Greg? He warned he was going to drop out. Oh, okay. okay. Heavy rain. Okay, looks like Greg has left the party. Okay, um, no, let's I'm move on to, to the... Here. Oh, you are here? Right, okay, yeah. great. Thanks, Greg. Uh, go Sorry, on. Yeah. Okay, 
sorry. My target is to reach net zero carbon emissions nationally by 2030. My plan is for extensive tree planting programs with a minimum of 15 or more trees that are harvested per person per year for the next 10 years. More community solar farms building on the success of the bigger model, more solar panels on business and government premises and much more battery capacity. Changes to the national power grid to allow transition to a higher percentage of decentralized green energy generation. More wind farms, including, including co-location with existing solar farms. Hydroelectricity generation, including energy storage by the use of excess electricity to pump water back up to the, into reservoirs. Green hydrogen fuel production and export. Government incentives to enable affordable transition to electric vehicles for all Australians, including manufacturing vehicles and component parts in Australia and more regional electric vehicle charging stations. Thank you. Great, thanks Greg for your very efficient answer to the question. Um, okay, we're going to go now to the second question and I'll share screen for that second question. Just fix my timer. Here we go, second question. So all candidates have received this question, which is about oil and gas. According to UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, the world is on a fast track to a catastrophic three degrees of warming because of government inaction, vested interests and historic investment in fossil fuels globally. The International Energy Agency says we must stop burning oil and gas now. If elected, what will you do to stop the opening of new and accelerate the transition out of old coal, of coal mines and gas fields in Australia. So that's the question. We're looking forward to your answers to the question. And this time we are going to start with James Holgate from the Sustainable Australia Party. Over to you, James. Thanks, yeah, well, um, the Sustainable Australia Party plans to, as I mentioned earlier, impose a moratorium on all new coal mines in Australia and a moratorium on fracking, including coal seam gas phase out fossil fuel subsidies and adopt a globally consistent carbon pricing mechanism that does not unfairly penalise Australian industries. And I think it's very important to realise that while we might be phasing out, I'm interested in results. And if any of these policies result in actual a global increase in emissions, it's not very good policy. I mean, you could argue burning brown coal is better than burning trees. Black coal is better than brown coal. Oil is better than gas, uh, you know, and, and the whole nuclear sort of argument. I'm interested in realistic, achievable policies, but certainly I think the, the way forward and really the only hope in a way is that we make fossil fuels redundant through affordable renewables. And that's an international um, uh, challenge, if you like. And I think Australia can be ahead of the curve certainly in implementing technology and policies, and then uh, exporting that technology for the betterment of the planet as a whole. Great, thank you, James. Now to Andrew Taller for your response to this question. Over to you, Andrew. Uh, renewables are already affordable. Now, I'm gonna give you a challenge, Climate Action Monero, invite me to your meeting. I need longer than two minutes or one minute 30 to explain some of these issues. I've already typed a point in. When you start withdrawing commodities from the market, other suppliers of those commodities that are not subject to your political will keep supplying, those prices go up. And if we need to use those products to bring the goods in that we're buying, our goods get more expensive and we create a feedback loop. We can't accept a position where on one hand, we're encouraging customers to be responsible, but then they're chasing a cheaper price. So unless you understand the broader political climate around the world and what's going on. Now, oil, gas, all these things, they're all based off a of price. And we've seen even the price of oil go negative, which is insane to even comprehend. So it's a lot more complex and it requires a lot more thought and action. Now, I was in solar research in 1995 where solar panels used to cost $1 per watt. Now, solar panels cost 35 cents per watt. Sorry, in 1995, solar panels were $20 a watt. In 2010, they were a dollar a watt. Now they're 43 cents, 34 cents, depending Chinese or German. We see that renewables are affordable, but yet people have not 
taken them up to their full extent. Electric cars, as I said, Thanks, it is Andrew. not just simple to. Yep. Yeah, it's Thanks, too Andrew. hard for one minute Thumbs study. Up. It's too complex. Okay, too bad. That's the rules. Let's go to Vivian. Well, that's Thanks, Vivian. Rules because you don't get good answers, Joe. Vivian, over to um, you. Okay. One minute thirty. Okay, um, the Greens policy is that there should be no new coal mines or gas fields. And that is a very publicly made condition to us working with any other party in a minority government in the future. Um, we're also uh, planning to uh, make fossil fuel companies pay a levy so that we can use that for our climate uh, fuel disasters and pa help pay for people in bushfires and floods. And we're also... Uh, Oh, I've lost that train of thought. Oh, stop native forest logging because someone was asking about it in the uh, chat. So I wanted to say that our policy is to stop native forest logging, but it's right. Thank you. That'll do. Great. Thank, thanks, Vivian. Over to Christy now. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we have said in terms of any new coal mines that they would need to pass independent environmental checks and they would need to stack up commercially. Then they will go ahead if the market determines that 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 is what they want to do. The fact is coal will need to be in our system, particular, particularly in the evenings for some time to come until we can get more renewable energy into the system. Um, Labor's Powering Australia policy look, aims to get 82% renewables in the system by 2030. Um, and we know there needs to be a, a transition. Um, we know renewables are going to be the most reliable, cheapest and cleanest energy source going forward. And it will be a race, um, but there needs to be a, a transition. Great, thanks, Christy. And now over to Tony McLennan for your response to that question. Yes, look, I, I agree that we need to do, uh, you know, what the UN Secretary General has said that we should do, and that is to uh, stop using burning oil and gas, and we need to do it um, as soon as we can. Uh, I guess the thing is, what can I do as an independent in Parliament? I can, you know, uh, stand up for, you know, stand up for this and, and keep reminding the government of how important it is that we protect the environment. I mean, the um, Informed Medical Options Party, we would like an investigation actually into the chemicals used on our foods and um, in, you know, things that are put in our water uh, it's because we want to make sure that the health of Australians and the health of the planet and the health of the animals is a priority. Um, you know, I, I think we need to get people in Parliament. I know I'm harping on about it, but nothing's going to change until we change the political landscape. I mean, if you want if you want these things to happen, then we have to vote in people who are not, you know, going to be bound by a political, a, a vast political machine. And that's what we have in Labor and Liberal. They're machines. And, um, you know, sometimes they don't act in our best interest. And I'd like to see a parliament that full of people that actually, you know, really work toward a better, um, you know, a better Australia, a better future. I don't want to leave my grandson, you know, a planet that's, um, you know, Thanks, Tony. in trouble. Thanks, Tony. Um, over now to Darren Garnon, UAP. Um, I've got to say, I keep on sitting here listening to the politics game, but why a party? I mean, I'd like to know, what is Vivian Harris thinks she has some sort of uh, proclamation on being environmental? I've lived my whole life this way. So just because I represent the UAP doesn't mean I'm not as environmental as anyone else in this room. So when you guys talk about fossil fuel burning, I want to know what does actually mean? Do you mean the extraction from the ground or do you mean the actual flaming of the product? Because just a little uh, couple of facts for you. We, we can take the technology of gas to liquid to make uh, lubricating oils. A quick number says that 10,800 windmills are required to uh, energise Australia's domestic use. Just another number for you is that 10,800 will require 4 million litres of gearbox oil to run the transformers. So again, that's why I say we, we can have one without having to you know, kill the other, that they, they, they will work in harmony together. This is an industry that um, I'm involved in. I come from this, this field of uh, lubrication and, and oils and so forth. The other thing is what people have got to realise, let's say that we'll take the turbine blades, <clears throat> they are made of polymers. You cannot recycle them. Why don't we look at using hemp 
as, and develop that technology with strong fibre to make our various products that we need from there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Darren. And wrapping up this question with Greg Butler from the Democrats. Over to you, Greg, for your response to this question. Hope you're still out there. Yes, I dropped out for a little while, but I'm back now. Uh, question on oil and gas. We have been placed in a difficult position by past government policies leading to the granting of coal and gas export contracts that stretch into the future decades of past government policies. We have also been slow to develop alternative energy sources to coal, oil and gas. When elected, I will vote against the granting of any new export licences for coal or gas and vote against the extension of any existing export contracts. Where possible, I will negotiate an early end to existing export contracts. But we also must not lose our local mining expertise. I look at mining from a long-term perspective. I do not support the total closure of all, all coal mines and natural gas extraction in Australia. We can run a few small extraction operations, not as our main source of fuel for power generation, and achieve net zero carbon emission by planting trees and other measures as adequate offsets. Coal and natural gas are finite resources and our current rate of consumption is not sustainable. From a long-term economic perspective, it is better to preserve and sensibly use our natural assets rather than exhaust them by shipping, shipping them offshore at cheap prices. Thank you. Great. Okay, thank you, Greg, for that, for your response. We'll go now to our third and final formal question before we go to Q&A. So I'll just share my screen for this third question. Um, noting too that we tried to focus on environmental questions where the responsibility lies at federal level. So this is a biosecurity question. We're right now in a decade of biosecurity, but it's nowhere near enough. Yellow crazy ants are creating havoc in Townsville. Red fire ants are creating havoc in households and businesses across Queensland. These are pests like we've never known before. European wasps are destroying the insect ecology in Australia's fragile alpine areas, and cane toads have reached Sydney. These and other pests represent a massive risk to the biosecurity of our environment and agriculture. So what will you do in government to put in place sufficient funding and strong programs for biosecurity to protect our fragile environments, domestic and export agriculture and people from these pests? So we're starting this round with Vivian Harris of the Greens. So over to you, Vivian. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, we don't actually have any official policy on biosecurity, but we in our official policies, there is that we intend to increase funding for science research and also for the CSIRO. And since our policies are based on science and we consult experts to develop them, I feel quite sure that we will give biosecurity the funding and the support that it needs. Okay, thank you, Vivian. Um, and now to James Holgate of Sustainable Australia Party. I suppose seeing some of the images of uh, struggling fauna brings home most poignantly to me the tragic consequences of environmental degradation. Australia's got a horrendous record lately of uh, extinction. Uh, we've got political uh, malfeasance on my in my opinion, with with things like the Brumby Protection Bill, in a in a you know unique uh, and rare uh, Kosciuszko National Park environment, where you know the, I can't imagine that you could protect a highly destructive feral animal um, at the expense of critically endangered species. Um, yeah, without trying to get too depressed about it, I'm actually a member of the Invasive Species Council and uh, I've sat in a long webinar recently. It's tough, it's an international problem and, and anyway, but uh, we certainly, the Sustainable Australia Party will support a stronger Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act to protect Australia's environment and biodiversity, including properly funded and enforced national biodiversity and native species program. I think federal government should uh, take over responsibility, environmental responsibility solely because then you get this sort of, uh, you know, 
argy-bargy between the states. I mean, the Murray-Darling Basin, the condition of that is, a, is an example, degradation there, the salination and so on. Um, and, and, of course, overdevelopment is causing, I mean, the Thanks, koala James. has become ex endangered. And I think overdevelopment's got a lot to do with that. Anyway. Great. Th thanks, James. Um, over to Tony McLennan. Yes, look, I share um, James's views and uh, we we in the Informed Medical Options Party, while it's not one of our uh, specific policies, we have we had a discussion about this sort of thing the other night and we totally agree that, you know, we need to do more. I mean, it's just uh, it's just not good enough. Um, and, you know, why why are these things happening? I mean, we've got to ask ourselves What's the cause of it? Is there not enough will in Parliament or are they, you know, in a kind way, are they incompetent? I mean, why are these things happening that shouldn't be happening that's destroying our environment? And, I mean, it's fundamentally important these things don't come into Australia and destroy, you know, our, um, our native um, ecosystems and animals. I mean, it's... It, I, I don't know what to say, but it, it, it makes me angry and it makes me upset. And I'm just grateful there are groups like you in the world who stand up. And I, and I guess in Parliament, what I can do is be a thorn in their side. Um, as, a, as a voice in Parliament, I could shine a light on it. I could continue to shine a light on it. I could stand up to it. I would like to you know, meet regularly with people like you um, and bring it to the public's attention. A lot of people wouldn't know, you know that there's 1,800 species you know, being uh, currently extinct or going into extinction. I mean, they'd be horrified. So bringing it to the public's attention, keeping it in the public domain and making people, you know, stand up with us. And, um, you know, I'd be happy to do that because it's something that's important to me. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, okay, over now to Greg Butler, Democrats. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, biosecurity in this country has been failing for years. As a former director of a rural lands protection board, part of my task was to reduce the number of feral pigs, including those congregating at a landfill site on the outskirts of Sydney. This site received waste from Sydney Airport, including illegally imported food confiscated from passengers to prevent the introduction of exotic pests and diseases. This waste should not have been placed in an open landfill. This major breach of biosecurity illustrates the need for more rigorous border controls and a greater awareness of the risks involved. Shipping containers are another biosecurity risk. Current methods of shipping container fumigation are poorly targeted and ineffective. I will vote for funding for stronger measures to stop future pest invasion and development of biological controls to eliminate current destructive pests such as cane toads. I will support an urgent review of the structure and funding of existing fire ant control programs to make them more community-based and much more effective than they are at present. We have fragile and unique environments that we have an obligation to preserve. I'll remind you that you, if you keep on doing the same thing, you'll keep getting the same result. If you want sustainability, don't vote for the major parties. And I have time for a joke. Uh, if many of these pests came in by boat, why aren't they in detention centres? Thank okay. You. Thanks, Greg. Let's go now to Christy McBain for Labor. Thanks. Um, we know it's a huge issue across the country at the moment, and especially across our region. Fer feral animals like deers, pigs, horses are doing damage to our environment. The fact is that over the last decade, the Morrison-Joyce government's hollowed out uh, biodiversity conservation. Um, a few days ago, Labor announced um, that a uh, future Albanese Labor government would commit $9.8 million to contain and eradicate dangerous gamba grass infestations in the Northern Territory. There'll be more announcements on it. Um, and the critical thing is making sure that we are working with our state governments, with local land services and community groups to start dealing with a whole range of issues um, from a local level up. Okay, thank you, Christy. Now to Andrew Tyler, Independent. Uh, just a geography lesson, Christy. Uh, we're in southern New South Wales, not uh, Northern Territory. We're talking about local issues. Now, I have killed quite a lot of European wasp nests around our scrapyard. We've got 100 acres here at Nimitabel, and a lot of people ask, how? We don't have any broad teaching through our community of what to do or how to do it. And our councils don't help. 
So I would ensure that there was appropriate funding from federal government through to state government so that councils can actually physically help, be set up to do it. Now, we've got St John's Wallet, we've got Lovegrass, we've got all these other type of things. They keep piling on top of each other and biosecurity is not a core priority of local government because local government manages all the public land space in the Shire, which is infested with weeds. Uh, wild horses are not feral animals anymore. Now that's not to say I've taken up the policies of the Animal Justice Party, but I think that it's a, an emotive topic that's been made unnecessarily emotional. There is more to the story. I don't wanna get involved into the stupid greens versus everyone else debate. It's actually a core biosecurity issue. It threatens our food production ability. It threatens our immunity. So let's just get, get to actually educating and empowering the people to eradicate proper pests when they see it. Understanding things like Thanks, apex Andrew. predator relationships with the dingo. That's Thanks, what Andrew. Yeah. And finishing off now with Darren Garnon for UAP. Yeah, thanks, Joe. <laughs> I just did some research uh, knowing that the, the biosecurity protection for Australia, for our agriculture, our forestry, our fisheries, is a $51 billion industry that we're protecting. The, um, for tourism, our clean environment brings in $50 billion. And the, the industry, through the biosecurity and the clean acts, we employ 1.6 million people. I think it is, goes without saying that we have to look after our environment and keep our energy, keep our areas clean. Doesn't matter which way you're going to do it, we all want to live in that environment. Myself, I'm a keen bushwalker, and I also do a fair bit of bush bike riding, gravel bike riding through the bush. Nothing disappoint, disappoints me more when I see just rubbish discarded along the way. The stuff that you can carry it in, you carry it out. It's an old saying we had as a surface when I was a young boy. One of the big things I like to see is probably the removal of the foxes, et cetera, because we know on the south coast, wherever the foxes have been removed, we've seen the removal of, um, we've seen the, actually the increase of the live bird population come back. So that'd be one thing that I'd be sort of looking at. The other aspect has been brought up to me, everyone's talking about the plains, but equally we have some major issues. We have fish stock on the south coast. This will be affecting our south coast villages in the coming future through the uh, net, this or the sign net, net fishing within the New South Wales Maritime Park. There's a number of uh, trawlers that are willing to give up their licenses. We really need to look at that to save our village towns from, uh, for, so the recreational fishing will still come and spend money. Thanks, Darren. Thanks, Joe. Great. Well, thanks to all of our candidates for responding to those three set questions. Um, we are now over to, there's been very busy action in the chat and lots of questions there and the the Zoom team has organised those questions. So, and we have um, about 10 minutes for questions. So the first question, the person who is asking this question is Jocelyn Vandermolen from Friends of the Forest and Coast Watchers. Hi there, Jocelyn. Um, and this is directed to uh, anyone who has a policy on this. So um, Greens and Labor. So what is, and others who might have a policy, so let's start with Greens and then to Labor. What is your policy on stopping public native forest logging in Australian forest to allow these trees to act as a carbon sink negating carbon emissions? I'll go to from, start with Vivian, then to Christy, and then to anyone else who has a policy on that. Over to you, Vivian, just a quick okay. one minute answer. Our, our policy is to stop native forest logging as you know as soon as possible, preferably yesterday. You know, it we need the forest as a carbon sink. We need them as habitat, and logging causes bushfires to be more frequent and more dangerous. Great. Okay. Thanks, Vivian. Christy. Uh, the, the Labor Party um, does support both our hardwood and softwood uh, logging industries. We need to make them sustainable. We have uh, timber shortages across the country. Um, and if we are importing um, logs from overseas, we can't guarantee that they've been logged sustainably um, or that we've dealt with any work health safety issues. Great. Thanks, Christy. Um, now, do any of the other candidates wish to make a response to that? 
Uh, look, I, I, if I may, James, James here. Um, obviously, we'd like to see uh, a stop to any uh, old growth forest. I think, um, you know, it can be a renewable industry with um, new growth forests. Uh, it's Again, it's an international problem. I think there's rapacious commercial practices in places like in the Pacific where uh, unscrupulous uh, commercial interests uh, work against the environmental outcomes, you know, deforesting the Solomon Islands and so on. Uh, we'd also like to see uh, wildlife habitat corridors uh, incorporated into rural areas to allow, um, I mean, the native um, national parks are basically islands of, you know, of, of uh, habitat. So we'd like to, a, a network um, of habitat to interconnect, and I think there'll be a, a, a many spin off benefits for that environmentally, commercially, um, and in sustainability. Okay, great. Thank you, James. We'll move on to the next question. Um, oh, okay, Darren, yeah, you can, sorry, you're waving your hand there, Madeline. Yeah, th thanks, yeah, Jane. yeah quick um, response, and then we'll move on to the next yeah. question. Another thing I'd just like to add to it's also good to see uh, farmers taking up the uh, issue of planting more trees. Well, they've actually realised and woke up the fact that if you plant trees as hedges along the way, it actually keeps our topsoil in place when the winds blow. So that's been a big change that I've, I've noticed in um, the last number of years when I'm travelling around and education there for the farmers. Okay. okay, thank you, Darren. Next question. Um, and Dave Darlington asked this question. It's directed to all candidates. Um, what and so all candidates will have the opportunity to answer this. What do you see as your number one action for a federal government in terms of support to bushfire suppression? Your number one action for a federal government in terms of support to bushfire suppression? A very quick answer. Uh, Darren, you can start. You're on screen. Then we'll go to Andrew. Um, I'd like to see the local RFSs have a bit more control in their, their own area instead of centralising it like we have, um, we've seen recently. My wife worked for National Parks for 25 years, so we've had a bit of experience around this uh, this whole topic tonight we're talking about. It's a, it's a clean conversation in our house, so yep. that'd be my answer, Joe. Okay, thank you. Andrew, your number one action for a federal government in terms of bushfire suppression? I would... Uh properly support the local RFS so that uh, out of the areas they're not driving 20 and 30 year old equipment and at the managerial levels of the RFS being too thick with bureaucrats the decisions need to be local and made by locals with a stronger reliance on the farmers who live work and have grown up in those areas. Okay thanks Andrew um, let's go to Greg now Greg Butler number one federal government action for bushfires? I think the most important action the federal government can take is to empower local communities to do more cool burning and to also um, promote the uh, cool burning philosophies of the Indigenous people that have worked for so many years. Great. Thanks, Greg. Now to Tony. Action for federal government on bushfire suppression. Well, I think like some of the other candidates have said, we need to listen to what's, you know, the locals have said, I lost a business in the Mogo bushfires in 2019. And I know there was a lot of work done after that, reviewing what worked and what didn't work. And I think we, we need to look at those uh, reviews and uh, listen to the recommendations and, and take it federal and make sure that federally, uh, you know, that we're on top of it and we're in control of, of how what's happening around the states it needs to be uniformed and it needs to be um you know get, the locals need to be a part of that process great thanks tony over to james uh thanks look i would certainly agree with um, the localization of people on the ground uh if i could just add to that it, it seems crazy that there's a you know, a bushfire crosses Victoria into New South Wales and you've got separate firefighting services. So greater coordination and um, follow the advice, uh, the best latest scientific advice. Technology, I think a Andrew might have talked about um, uh, spotting towers and so on and, and using drones and that sort of thing. Um, yes, control burns. Co a coordinated, comprehensive approach that uses the best information based on science. Great. Thank you. Now to Vivian. Number one action. Um, that's what I'm having trouble doing is thinking of number one action. 
um, we need to we need to learn to care for care for nature and care for our environment. And if that involves cultural burning and not logging, then that's my number one. Great, thanks, Vivian. And Christy, finishing off on this question. Thanks. I think the, the number one thing we can do is actually start to spend money on uh, mitigation and resilience measures for our communities. Um, um, over the last little while, we've seen um, obviously a lot of bushfires in our region and we've got a lot of um, ideas from local members about how we can make ourselves more resilient come the next natural disaster. We need to make sure our fire trails are maintained so that uh, RFS can get in there and we need to uh, assist people uh, by making sure we have a coordinated approach to um, bushfire uh, when it erupts. Thank you, Christy. Okay, going to the next question which is from Joe Dodds, President of Bushfire Survivors for Climate Action. And we'll again go through all candidates. I will ask you to be quick because we've only got probably another five or seven minutes left. Um, so Joe Dodds' question is, what is your emissions reduction target? Um, she's just interested in the date that each candidate, independent or party, proposes to reach zero. So the date that you will reach zero emissions. Let's um, go from the top. Let's go backwards. Christy, over to you. Sorry, what was the question? Yeah, the date, the date for reaching zero. Emissions reductions target, net yep. zero, net uh zero. We've committed to net zero by 2050, 43% uh, reduction by 2030 and higher if we can. Thank you, Christy. Over to Vivian. Uh, the Greens want, want uh, net zero by 2035 and aiming for 75% reduction by 2030. Okay, great. Thank you. Tony McLennan, your target for net zero? Uh, 2035. Okay, thank you. Andrew Tala? Oh, I have no target because I'm no economic rationalist and I understand the problem is way bigger than anybody wants to contemplate. So invite me to your meeting and we'll talk it through and we'll come up with a realistic date together. Thank you. Uh, James Holgate. Yeah, certainly we should commit to achievable uh, targets. Ours are, for the record, a minimum a target of net zero by 2050, preferably by 2035 and at least by 50% below 2005 levels by 2030. But uh, there's one thing to say, there's another thing to do. Okay, thank you, James. Uh, Darren Garnon, UAP. Yeah, I just, when you're talking about targets towards net zero, um, what does that actually look like for our lifestyle as well? So I just put that there. I'm not really sure what the, the party's position is on it. I know my own, I'm on the environment. Okay, thank you, Darren. And finishing up this one with Greg Butler. Yes, I'm going to be ambitious. I'm, I'm worried about this. So we'll go for 2030, net zero emission 2030. Go for it. Great, thank you. Okay, um, moving on to, uh, this is one quick question. Um, and this is from Jenny Goldie, Climate Action Monero. Question to James Holgate. Would you cap political donations? Oh, Jenny, I, did I ask you to ask me that question? Is that is that a, a Dorothy Dixon? Please look at our comprehensive um, approach to, to uh, stopping corruption. This is something that actually got me interested in politics in the first uh, instance because uh, for mine, uh, parties are beholden to the donor's interest, not the broader interests of um, the Australian community, and uh, that's what's attracted me to the Sustainable Australia Party. I think we need real-time, open, transparent uh, donations and a greater um, ability for smaller parties to get public funding to level the playing field as far as political, um, you know, participation goes. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, James. Thanks for answering that question. The next question um, is from Rachel Clark, also of Climate Action Monero, and this question is to all candidates. And the question is this, do you read the IPCC reports, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports? 
And if so, do you think your policies will keep us below two degrees? Now, James, you're on the screen, so we'll kick off with you and then work back the other way. Yeah, sure. I, look, um, there's talk about if uh, if we stop turning off the lights and everything tomorrow, apparently emissions in, internationally will be will make a very small dent. If we shut everything, apparently it will make something like 0.25 of one degree difference by uh, 2100. Um, but yeah, look, we need to be ahead of the curve. Um, and um, sorry, what was the question? Okay. Do you read the IPCC reports? Uh, and if so, do you think your policies will keep us below yeah. two degrees? Look, I haven't read them length to length. I've read summaries. I've done ex extensive reading yeah. about climate over many, many years. Um, so I'm certainly uh, on top of that. But just to go back to my earlier no, point, will no, our no, policies we'll move work? back because everyone's going to yes. answer this. Yeah, thanks. Darren, over to you now. Thanks, James. Yeah, I started reading it years ago. Um, I found out that the, a lot of information was fraudulent. I lost a bit of faith in the, uh, the whole IPC uh, writings. Uh, I find my, I look for my information in other places uh, to try and balance view of the whole thing. Okay, thank you. Um, Tony McLennan, IMO, do you think, do you read IPCC reports? Will your policies help us below, stay below two? Uh, we, I haven't read the IPCC report in a long time. In the last couple of years, I've been focusing really on the COVID nightmare. That's been my focus. And, um, but I have certainly uh, been interested in this issue of the environment and climate change. And I have read various articles and, and things, but no, uh, but it is something I intend to read. I've, I was only um, endorsed as the candidate a few weeks ago. So I'm, okay. trying, to get, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get up to speed with a lot of things. Okay, thanks, Tony. Let's go now to uh, Andrew Tala. Will your policies uh, keep us below two degrees? I don't have policies. I take action. Um, policies are something that the Greens and the Labor have, which they write down on paper from the trees that they cut down. Okay, thank I you, Andrew. Let's go to Labor for an answer. Uh, I haven't read the latest IPCC report, which I think came out in April. I read the summary for policymakers generally. Yeah. And what about your policies, keeping us below two? Uh, yep. Uh, we, the Labor Party has a suite of policies on climate change and our shadow minister has done an amazing job at making uh, our policy um, applicable to everyone. Okay, Greg Butler, Democrats, um, do you read IPCC reports and will the policies keep us below two degrees? I don't read the reports in full. I read the read summaries. Uh, our policies are designed to keep us below two degrees. If, if these, uh, I also read other reports. If we don't uh, take action now, by 2300, we have another great dying event coming. Okay, and finishing off with Vivian Harris of the Greens for your response to that question. Okay, I admit that I don't read the entire 3,000 pages of the IPCC report. I read the, some, the technical summary and I read the chapters that interest me. Um, I am confident that our policies are compatible with attempting to stay as close as 1.5 as possible because we don't, we don't want to get anywhere near two degrees. Great. Thanks, Vivian. And final question, which is a yes, no question. Same question to all candidates. And this is the question. Will you support the end of all public funding and subsidies for coal, oil and gas and redirect those public funds and subsidies to enabling renewable energy? So ending all public funding to coal, oil and gas, oil and, gas and redirecting it to renewables. Vivian, you can... Uh, sorry, I, sorry, I wasn't paying attention. I was reading the chats. So okay. you have to say it again. All right, okay. That's a yes, no question. Will you support the end of all public funding and subsidies for coal, oil and gas and redirect those public funds and subsidies to enabling renewable energy? Yes or no? Yes. Tony McLennan, yes or no? Yes. Greg Butler, yes or no? Yes. Uh, Darren Garnon, yes or no? Yep. Stop subsidies to all industries. They can stand their own two feet. 
Andrew Tala, yes or no? No, because it's it's just disingenuous. It's not even rational. Okay, James Holgate, yes or no? Uh, look, there are two parts of that. Yes to the first part. And second, I think uh, renewable energy is going to become, won't need subsidies. Okay. And Christa McFain, Labor, yes or no? Yes, I think that uh, we should end um, any public funding of building new coal or gas. Um, subsidies, I think, are in the system for uh, a lot of energy providers, and I don't think they're going away anytime soon. Okay, great. Um, thank you to all of our candidates for turning up tonight, for answering questions. Um, and yes, you may have had limited time, but we covered a lot of territory. There was a lot of conversation in the chat. Thank you to the Climate Action Monero and NCC team for being behind the scenes in this. Thanks to all the voters who attended this forum. I hope this forum has helped you inform your voting choice. And finally, thanks to the candidates who have several weeks of campaigning in front of them. We wish you a safe and productive campaign. We're one minute past 8.15. Um, it's been a terrific evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. We'll, clo we'll close the meeting room now. Thank you.